Beginning almost immediately after the publication of Dungeons and Dragons in 1974, TSR designers, as well as amateur hobbyists, many of whom would become future RPG professionals, began writing articles for Dragon Magazine that began to expand and explore the scope of the game by creating variants such as new classes, spells, and monsters, but also delving into mechanics like combat and magic systems, or offering philosophical essays on the background on the purpose of the game. We're going to talk about some of these fundamental early creations in our overview of Dragon Magazine issues number two and three today on Daddy Rolled a One. It's a quick plug for my friend DM Tales. He's also on YouTube and does a lot of great videos about tabletop role-playing game content. He's hosting a convention in Palmy Palmyra, New Jersey, April 12th, 14th. It's a Kleezacon, and it's got a lot of games planned, including some old school games. So he's got people that are going to be running um, second edition advanced D&D. BX, uh, someone's running Keep on the Borderlands. So if you're in that area, I think it's like... Um, south jersey and and parts of the philadelphia area um definitely check out um Ecclesicon if you can thanks hello there and welcome back i'm martin this is another video on my series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games including dungeons and dragons and also part of my sub series on the history of dragon magazine so if you came to this video because you saw a thumbnail that looks kind of like this I know that might look kind of clickbaity, and I guess in a way I, I was trying to capture one of the important moments from this video to try to get more views. So I'll admit that. And um, but it is not a bait and switch. So I actually do want to talk about this because there was a period in time where um, the creators of D and D were thinking about the game in terms of female or women characters, not players, but the characters having different abilities and stats and. Um, you know, class level limits and things like that, different from male characters. So I'm going to jump right to that first so that we can make sure that people, um, again, if you came here because of that, you don't think that um, the video doesn't include that content because it does. And then what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to come back and talk about Dragon Magazine issues number two and three, uh, pretty much cover to cover. And we're going to talk about the writers, the creators, the artists who worked on that and some, you know, kind of their legacy. But also the legacy of some of the content that we see in these early issues of Dragon Magazine and how it influences the game of Dungeons and Dragons as it is played today, um, you know, even in fifth edition, which is where we're at right now in 2024, getting ready for the new um, revised, whatever it's going to be called, that, that's going to come out later in September of 2024. But let's jump right to this, this article here. So this is Dragon Magazine issue number three published in October of 1976, talking about this article over here on the right-hand side. So this is about, I mean, it's a little more than two and a half years after Dungeons & Dragons has been published, uh, January of 1974. But I'd still call it the dawn of the hobby. The the creators and, you know, whether they're professional or amateur hobbyists, whatever you want to call them, they're all looking at opportunities that they can hack this game and figure out what works and what doesn't and, and what mechanics can be changed and, and you know, creating new options, new variants, all that kind of stuff to help create uh, a game that they want to play. And for whatever reason, this particular article is going to dive into this idea that women characters should have different treatment than male characters. So this is notes on women and magic, bringing the distaff gamer into D&D. &D. So if you see that title, you might be fooled into thinking that this is two different articles, one on the left and one on the right. Um, that is the full title of this article, uh, which is a clunky title to begin with, but also this drastic change between the font on the left and the font on the right and the all caps and the bold and the italics and then the lowercase. It's just, it's a mess from a layout standpoint. And I bring that up because again, this is very early on in the history where they're figuring out like layout, like how does this work? And you know, they don't have computers and things that they're doing and stuff. This is all being done by hand. What's called paste up where you have to like arrange it first. And then it's like photographed and, and then mimeographed after that, or, you know, photocopied or printed. But 
there's it, the layouts being done by hand in little sections of paper that are pieced together and then pasted down. So um, for whatever reason, they thought this was the layout that was going to work. Now, this is by Len Lakofka. We've talked about Len before on the channel. The short version is he was a friend of Gary Gygax. Len had developed his own setting that he was using for, um, you know, his own fantasy setting that he was using to play these types of games in called the Lendor Isles. And uh, with his friendship with Gary Gygax, the Lendor Isles are eventually incorporated into the world of Greyhawk. So if you're familiar with the uh, adventures, this is probably the most famous depiction of the Lendor Isles would be these adventures that were written in the 80s by Len Kafka, the L series, most specifically the, the two that most people would be aware of. Um, would be L1, The Secret of Bone Hill, and then L2, The Assassin's Knot. So those um, are take place in the in the Lendor Isles. Len was very instrumental in helping develop the pantheon for the world of Greyhawk beyond the original gods that Gary designed. So Len does a lot with like the Sewell pantheon. And he has a long ongoing column in Dragon Magazine called Lumen's Tiny Hut, where he explores new ideas and spells and classes and and, you know, just variants. And that was my first exposure to Len was through one of his columns in my first issue of Dragon Magazine that I ever got, which was issue number 76 in um, the uh, early 80s. And he'd written a column with a Death Master NPC. And um, that was where I first heard of him, even before I'd heard of The Secret of Bone Hill and Assassin's Knot. But in any event, um, I really like a lot of Len Lakofka's content. I think it's very creative and it's interesting to read it from a standpoint of being one of the early pioneers that were there at the, at the beginning of this hobby creating content for the game this article is definitely not one of those things that that i particularly like it's um i i, I want to say it's a product of the time but i think even at the time this would have been viewed as being very very sexist so i i bring it up because one it's it's we're talking about dragon magazine this article's in there it is going to have a legacy later on that i'm going to get to but the implication of this, the premise of this article is that women characters should have different characteristics than male characters. And then it goes through to explain this. And it is very, very sexist. So um, I'm just going to jump in and talk about it. He says there will be four major groups in which women may enter. They may be fighters, magic users, thieves, and clerics. So this is interesting. Again, we're talking about history here. So if you remember the original character classes from Dungeons and Dragons were fighting men, magic users, and clerics. Those are the original three. And then thieves were added in Greyhawk Supplement 1, which is 1975. However, he's using the word fighters here. So this is a weird, not weird, but it's a transition period where they're, we're getting away from that use of that word fighting man, which is, again, the original way the class was described. And this is starting to be one of the first instances where you're seeing it just referred to as being fighters instead of fighting men. Now, Greyhawk does intermix between the two. Sometimes it says fighting men and sometimes it says fighters, but it, it definitely leans into the fighting men. So this is before Holmes Basic comes out in 1877. This is before AD&D Player's Handbook, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook is published in 1978, which, which do make the ship the ad and player's handbook sh changes it to just fighter or fighters um but this is an early case and it makes sense because he's talking about women so it'd be stupid to call it fighting men it makes more sense to just say fighters okay the other thing that's interesting here is that given the time that this is written october of 1976 there were other classes that were available in original dungeon and dragons that had been published in the supplements. So in Great um, Blackmore Supplement 2, you have the Assassins and the Monks. We've talked about those classes before. And in Eldritch Wizardry, published in 1976, you have the Druid. Now, this article is published when those were available. However, it's very possible that it was written before they were published. So printing, um, you know, old school printing like this magazine thing had to be written well in advance. And um, it's possible that he had this written more than a year in advance and just it didn't end up being published until this period of time and they didn't go back and adjust it. Or it could be that he was aware of those classes and Len is saying women can't be assassins, monks, and druids. It's unclear which which one of those it is. Um, but that's, you know, at this point, that's the best that we have is to is understand that like he's basically they can't be, he's saying they can't be that and it could be an oversight or it could be deliberate. 
Okay, then he says, they may progress to level of men in the areas of magic and in some ways surpass men as thieves. And then he says, very interesting, elven women may rise especially to high levels and clerics to the elves. So I don't know why he points out elves specifically, but in Greyhawk Supplement 1, it does say, now typically elves, as depicted in the original D&D, are a combination of fighter and magic user, and you have to pick one at the start of your adventure. So you're not actually multi-classing, you're either acting as one or the other each adventure. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, see my video on race as class in Dungeons and Dragons. I'll put a link up here. Um, and it gets into this idea of certain races only being operating as certain classes. But in Greyhawk Supplement 1, it specifically calls out that there are clerics among the elves themselves. So that's very clunky wording, very typical for Gygax to not make it very clear. But what he's saying is that there are NPC clerics that are elves. You just can't be a PC cleric. That's what he's saying. Um, that, and so this article, that's why it's pointing out. He says, elven women may rise especially to high levels in clerics to the elves, not as a player character. Only as fighters are women clearly behind men in all cases. <laughs> Okay, so I, I told you it's, it's quite sexist. So um, to the point that he actually blends kind of change the abilities for female characters, for women characters. So he says strength, uh, it says 18-sided die and one six-sided die. I think that's a typo. It, it's got to be because there are no 18-sided die and it wouldn't make sense. I think what's it's supposed to say is strength is determined by one eight-sided die and one six-sided die. So you're creating a score from two to 14. So it's basically saying the maximum strength a female can have, a woman character can have, is 14. And he says, wisdom, intelligence, dexterity, and constitution all use the standard 3d6 die. So a score of three to 18. But any woman who has a score of 13 or 14 in strength can add one to her constitution score. And then instead of charisma, he's going to get rid of charisma and give women a beauty score which is rated on a scale of two to 20. So, um, <laughs> okay, I, I don't really see what the point is of doing that. So I'm not trying to make fun of Len. I'm not trying to make fun of any of this. I, I'm pointing it out because gameplay has changed. And, um, but again, at the time, this was an exploration of like, should there be differences? Because this was all pretty much being designed and thought of and play tested by men. And um, this is how they kind of thought that things could work. Okay. So some of the interesting stuff that comes out of this is um, there is a little bit of inspiration that you can take for world building as an example, the level titles. So the level titles for fighter, he's changing them. So as an example, in original D and D, a first level fighter, the level title is veteran. Here, it's fighting woman. It's clunky. We're not going to use that. But stuff like battle maiden or shield maiden or Valkyrie, those are some kind of cool terms that could influence your world building if you wanted to include them. Um, so, like there, um, you know, in in Tolkien among the Rohirrim, there are shield maidens. So you could think of a sort of being like a special class of warrior among the Rohirrim. And I think that's kind of a cool way to look at it. So the cleric titles are pretty bland. They're basically just changing the male version or the masculine version of words to the feminine. So instead of a deacon, a deaconess, and a canon, a canoness. So eh, not a lot there. The thief ones are extremely sexist. Um, so the, the thief level titles, and this is going to affect the rest of this article, the implication is that a woman thief is there to manipulate men and get them to do what she wants them to do. So, and you can just tell from the titles, Wench and Succubus and Sybil. Okay. So those are not something that I'd want to be inspired by in my game because it's extremely offensive, I think, to, um, you know, one player. Uh, the Magic User titles, again, very similar in, in clerics in terms of just kind of changing the form of the word from masculine to feminine. So and from enchanter to enchantress, whatever. Okay, fine. So a uh, couple more things that, again, are going to delve into the mechanics. If you see this down here at the bottom right-hand corner where it says fighters, and that gives you the hit dice, and then it gives you the fighting capability. So that fighting capability is based on the original um, system of combat in original D&D that is uh, based on chainmail. 
And so in the rules for original D&D, &D, it actually says you need chain mail in order to run this combat. Or there's an alternate combat system. Well, the alternate one is the one that ends up becoming the default that we still use today. Roll a D20, compare it to an AC, and, um, you know, to determine if you hit the... And, and it's based on your level, what you're going to add, what bonus you're going to add to that D20. And in Chainmail, it was based on how powerful you are as compared to a single figure. So when it says man, that was a singular figure. And then man plus one, two men plus one, three men, hero, that kind of thing. All of those had values within Chainmail so that you knew what that attack value was by referring to these different charts. That's all that that means. It's just interesting that... Um, even at this point, people had really shifted heavily towards what we, you know, at the time was called the alternate combat system, but he is kind of leaning into it here. So now we're, uh, you see more of that here on the left-hand side. So he describes the fighting abilities of clerics, thieves, and magic users. And then he gets into thieves. And it says women's statistics see Blackmore. And that's talking about in Blackmore where they start to discuss the abilities of different species that can operate as thieves and assassins and how that affects their skills. And it does start to kind of break out women versus um, men uh, with those different skills. So he talks about this and says, female thieves are the same as males, except that higher level female thieves can learn some limited magic. And that's going to affect pretty much every class that Len is saying a woman can operate as here. So um, he, so he goes all the way through, and then he says, Dwarf, Elven, and Hobbit women may act as thieves. So that's very similar to the regular uh, rules. And once you get to Greyhawk, that it says that Dwarves, Elves, and Hobbits may also be thieves. Okay, and then it talks about spells and casting spells as thieves. And you see the spell lists here. And again, very much the implication is that women are trying to manipulate men, seduction, and charm men. It's not charm person, it's charm man. And then there's tarot reading. So tarot reading is something that you could take from this. You could remove all of the, the baggage of the women versus men and all that kind of stuff and take this idea and think about, oh, could I have like a tarot reading ability or spell in my game and maybe get some ideas from here? Um, it talks about fighting women can also incorporate spells, but all of the spells that they're going to do, again, seduction, charm men, charm humanoid monster, it's all based on women using their feminine wiles to manipulate men to get them to do what they want. Um, and we've moved past that kind of thinking. So then it talks about magic users. There's no level, or there's no limit to the levels that women can go um, advance in magic. So remember at this point in time, different species had level limits of how far they could advance as a fighter, like a dwarf fighter. It doesn't have unlimited levels. There's a cap. And so Len is essentially treating women characters as almost like the way that they treated different races or species in the early part of the game, which is a very um, awkward and weird way of looking at it. Anyway, you've got your spells. Then you've got your um, level caps of how far that they can um, uh, advance. And then it talks about saving throws and then the spell of charm men. And charm now, look at how much space is being devoted in this magazine. We've already had a page back here. We've had um, a page here. So one, two, three. And now we're over here on the left-hand side. We have our last page where it talks about poison and there's ideas in here that you can try to pull out and, again, remove them from this context. But I'm not really sure it's worth it. There's better ideas out there that cover these topics. But, you know, take this ad out. You've got three and a half pages, almost four pages of a 32-page magazine <laughs> devoted to this idea of women characters and how to play them differently from male characters. And the reason I bring this up, again, is because pointing out what people were looking at at the time in terms of how to develop this game. But also what's interesting is this system does have a legacy within Dungeons and Dragons. So when you get to Gary Gygax's advanced Dungeons and Dragons player's handbook, he implements ability score caps for female characters that are different than male characters. And he does it across all of the races 
But the implication is that if you are a woman and you're, uh, I, don't, I don't have it in front of me right now, but like if you're a female, let's say um, halfling, and you um, roll your strength and you happen to roll 3d6 and get an 18. No, nope, you can't have that 18 because you're a female and you're a halfling. So your strength is going to be lowered. Okay. So it just automatically goes down. And if you were a male, it would be higher than it would be if you're a female. Now, why that makes a huge difference in advanced D&D is because level limits for non-human characters are based on your strength or your prime requisite, your your ability score. So it will say that like a female halfling fighter has to have a strength of X to get to a certain level, but that level is lower than it would be if she were a male halfling because her strength could theor- theoretically be higher so she could advance higher as a fighter. So it has a legacy in terms of the mechanics of advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Interestingly, these changes don't find their way into like Holmes Basic or Moldvay Basic, Menser Basic, like the Beckme sets, all those. That line of D&D doesn't deal with this at all. It has nothing to do, like there's nothing in there about the difference between women and men characters. But Gary puts it into advanced D&D. Now, if you want to do your research, I'm not going to get into it here, but you can look up where Gary has some very, uh, I'm just going to say antiquated views on gaming and the differences between men and women and how characters should be treated. And so I think that was part of it. But I think, you know, this article coming first, this article is coming out as Gary is working on advanced D&D. And we know that Gary and Len were friends. So I do think it's very possible that this article here ended up influencing Gary's designs in AD&D that incorporates some of this. Now, he doesn't make as drastic changes as Len does here. He doesn't have different um, ability scores. Like he doesn't have a beauty score for women instead of charisma. Um, And he doesn't have them roll their abilities differently, but he does put caps on them. And that's the legacy of this particular article. So if you came here for this to understand this part of the, that again, that thumbnail where I talked about women being treated differently. um, I hope you enjoyed this, but I really do hope that you stick around because there's going to be much more to come as far as different articles and the content affecting the future of Dungeons and Dragons. So let's dive in and start talking about Dragon issue number two. Also, I just want to apologize really quick for my voice. Um, I've got some really bad allergies going on right now, and it's um, kind of making me a little stuffy. And uh, so my voice might sound a little different. I, I do apologize for that. But Let's talk about Dragon issue number two. Now, this is going to come out in August of 1976. So again, we're about two and a half years after the debut of the first publication of original Dungeons & Dragons in January of 1974. So we have this uh, all-color cover here. And this art is done by an artist named Tom Canty. Now, Tom uh, eventually becomes known for doing a lot of different fantasy uh artworks, specifically a lot of book covers. So he does like the Keltiad series and uh, he does the covers for a lot of different like anthologies of um, like the year's best fantasy and horror uh, anthology covers. Um, His style is known mostly for kind of having an art nouveau quality. And a lot of people say that um, it looks very much like sort of a fantasy Gustav Klimt. Um, this is very early in his career, so you're not going to see that. But if you look at some of the other covers, you, you, you'll you see what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is his first cover for Dragon. He is going to end up doing a few more in the future. And this character here that you see, um, you wouldn't be blamed for thinking that that's Conan the Barbarian. It is not. It's actually going to be related to the short story that we see advertised here on the cover. So... First off, we see it's The Dragon. So I always call it Dragon Magazine because that's what it was when I started gaming, or we called it Dragon Mag a lot of times. But at this period in time, it was known as The Dragon. So if you're ever reading um, an editorial, a lot of times they will abbreviate it and put TD in all caps. It took me forever as a kid to figure out that that meant The Dragon. So 
later on it's gonna be known as Dragon Magazine, and then and then much later just Dragon. But in this period of time, it's the Dragon, the magazine of fantasy, swords and sorcery, and science fiction gaming. So it's very interesting that you know nowadays I think most people would put swords and sorcery as just part of fantasy, but in this period of time they're really breaking it out to fantasy being different from swords and sorcery, and then you know being different from science fiction. So then we see down here, uh, right-hand corner, kind of toward the bottom, new from Gardner Fox, The Shadow of, the, of a Demon. Now, what's interesting here is that the cover is really the chance to bring in an audience and get them interested in looking at this magazine, picking it up and flipping through it to see if you want to buy it and then eventually buying it. So the cover is where you're, you're basically doing your advertisement to pick up this magazine. And rather than calling out any of the Dungeons and Dragons content that is included in this, they're calling out a short story by a writer because at the time they thought that that was the thing that was going to drive people to go pick this up. Now, Gardner Fox is a very famous author and writer, and we're going to get to him in a minute when we get to his story. Uh, but just know that there's a reason why they're calling out him and this story um, versus any other content that might be in here. All right, so let's go uh, go on. So now we're on the inside covers on the left-hand side, and we see an ad for Gen Con 9. That's going to come up in a minute, but I'm going to skip past that for now. And we're going to go to the Dragon Rumble section here. So this is um, Timothy Cask's editorial statement for this particular issue. Now, if you remember... Um, Timothy Cask is actually the first person hired by TSR. He was not one of the founders. He was not one of the content creators like Dave Arneson that kind of helped. Um, I, I said kind of, I didn't mean kind of. Dave Arneson that worked on original Dungeons and Dragons with Gary. But he wasn't actually an employee of the company. He got paid, but he wasn't an employee. Tim Cask is the first person that TSR hires as you know an employee of the company. And he was hired specifically to edit a lot of different things, but he's the one that was responsible for the, for the transition from the strategic review to Dragon Magazine. If you haven't seen my video about the strategic review, I'll put a link up here for you. So he talks about, welcome to the pages of the fastest growing magazine in the hobby, and then welcome back to you, uh, those of you who were here last issue. So basically what he talks about is that the increase in fantasy gaming has been phenomenal. It's been exploding. And um, they're seeing that like it's taking off because he says even the two big companies of gaming, which are Avalon Hill and SPI, have come around to that view and are starting to create fantasy games. And um, he's saying that fantasy games are different from fantasy literature because fantasy gaming incorporates fantasy, swords and sorcery and science fiction. That's his definition of what fantasy gaming is. And then um, he says it's hard to like go around and not see zines covering Dungeons and Dragons if they're if they're like fantasy zines. And um, then he talks about the pr proliferation of titles within the fantasy gaming genre. And then he specifically says, what do you want to see in the future? So this is going to be a big thing that we're going to see from Tim time and time again. He's asking folks who are reading the magazine, what do you want us to cover? Because that's what he wants. He wants us to be sort of built by the community to make sure that he's giving people what they want to see, not just what he thinks. And so he says, what is it that you want? Do you want battle reports? Do you want fiction? Do you want reviews? Do you want variants? Do you want analyses? Do you want more art? So in particular here, just variants, basically what variants is, those are going to be things that you can use in, in games that are sort of like expanding or changing or, you know, creative new things. So think of variants as like, maybe a new character class or a spell or a monster or something like that. That's kind of what he's referring to there. So he tells you where to write uh, your comments to. And then we're going to get to this first article. Now notice there's no table of contents in here. Very frustrating if you're reading this magazine. Um, you can't just scan and see what's in here. You just have to start reading. So we get to Monkish Combat and the Arena of Promotion. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds on this particular one, but this is by John M. Seaton, whom we have talked about before in my video on Boot Hill and the other sort of like, you know, the 1975 post D&D &D role playing games. Um, I'll, there's a link up here for that. But John Seaton um, was an artist 
but also uh, a little bit of a content creator. And so he writes this article because in Blackmore Supplement 2, it talks about how when assassins, or I'm sorry, when monks are advancing in level, when they get to the higher levels, the only way to advance, once you have the experience points, it's not automatic. You have to seek out and find a person of that level that you're trying to get to and then face that person in a uh, combat arena to get promoted. And so John Seton's going to create this whole system here because he was really into martial arts. Um, he's going to create this whole system rather than just using the regular D&D attack matrices and, and regular combat, the order of combat. He creates this whole thing with blocks and high blocks and low blocks and kicks and strikes and all this kind of stuff. It's completely unnecessary. It's very fiddly. It's very rules heavy for very little return, uh, quite honestly. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I just think it's completely unnecessary. But again, it's important because, you know, he had an interest in martial arts, John Seaton, that is, and he's using his real world knowledge to say, hey, here's something that you can do in the game to make your game more realistic. That's a lot of things that you're going to see in these early parts of the games is trying to take the abstract systems that we use and change them to be, quote, more realistic. So that's kind of where he's going for here. He also does the art. So this art that you see here, this is by John Seaton. All right, let's keep going. So this is the continuation of the Gnome Cache. So this debuted in Dragon Magazine issue number one. And if you remember, it was by um, Garrison Ernst, it said. And I made a little flub in that particular one because I said, that Ernst was Gary Gygax's middle name. And, and I, I knew what I meant and I said it wrong. Ernest was his first name. Gary is actually his middle name. So it's Ernest Gary Gygax, E-G-G. And so when he says Garrison Ernst, he's using a pen name and I still to this day don't know. I don't know why he wrote this under a pen name rather than just let people know that that's who it was because everybody could probably figure it out anyway. Um, maybe he's just having fun, being clever. I'm not really sure. Um, but in any event, what's interesting here is there is no attribution to who the author was. So we know this is by Gary Gygax writing as Garrison Ernst, except that in this case, there's no um, attribution, like I said. So this is just, it's his funny story about Lumbo the elf. And um, actually, this is not Lumbo. Sorry, that's the other story that's going to come up later. This is... Um, Dunstan and the Gnome Cash story. And this is going to continue for several issues on. And you see um, a, a note down here, watch for TD, that's what I'm talking about, TD number four, the dragon number four in December of 1976, Empire of the Petal Throne issue. So at this period in time, Dragon is being published every other month. So this is issue two, which is August. Issue three will be October. And then issue four is going to be December. And then in the intervening months, the odd months, so September and um, November, et cetera. That's going to be another magazine called Little Wars. That's still published by TSR, but it's, um, uh, it's it, it delves more into strategy games and miniature war games versus this game, which is focused on, you know, quote, fantasy games. All right. Then we have the search for the Forbidden Chamber. This is the one I was thinking about. This is the one by um, Jake Jacket, who's later going to come on to um, be part of the staff on Dragon Magazine and eventually become an editor. Uh, but he's writing about Ralph the Wizard, Jim with the Dwarf, and Lumbo the Elf. So this is a more humorous story. Now, the art on these two pages that you see here at the bottom is attributed to staff later on. But if you see here on the right, it's it's a little hard to see, but the very the right picture with the elf uh, blowing bubbles out of his pipe, there's a signature down in the lower right-hand corner. That's for David Sutherland III, David C. Sutherland, who um, is eventually going to become like the staff artist for Dragon for a while, but that is by him. It's just, they just don't credit him later on, although he did sign it. Now, this one on the left, I'm not 100% sure who drew that. So there is no DCS, um, the third signature here. Um, it is that kind of cartoony style. Um, I don't want to misattribute it. So if uh, anybody knows who actually drew that, I did try really hard to kind of find it just to have some clarity, uh, but I couldn't find it. Okay, so that's that. So now we're going to get to mapping the dungeons, which is... Uh, 
this is basically just lists of people who played D&D so that you could write to them if you didn't have a dungeon master or players and you were looking for people in your area. So this column is going to continue kind of for a while. So um, then we have our Gen Con update. Okay, so this one is kind of interesting. It says the D&D Dungeons & Dragons tournament planned for Gen Con 9 is different in some respects from past attorneys in scope and selection learning. So we've talked about this when I talked about my history of D&D modules with the Giants series and how they were first played at tournaments and how tournaments are scored based on the actions of the players. Um, that's what they're talking about here. So in this particular case, they're talking about each group playing this uh, adventure, this tournament, is limited to five players. There's going to be a fighter. So again, we're seeing that we're shifting from that term fighting man, fighter, mage, cleric, elf, mage, and dwarf fighter. And these characters will have pre-rolled abilities and come equipped with certain magical goodies, but the magi and cleric, the, the players can pick their own spells, and all players will be able to select their own equipment. But the idea is that, they're again, they're going to score. And what was a little bit controversial for this particular one is that they didn't score as teams. They scored in, individually. So they gave prizes to, like, the best magic user, or in this case, they're calling it a mage, the best cleric. Regardless of whether that team won or lost, they're giving individual scores, and that's going to come up later, as we're going to see in Dragon Magazine number three. So um, what's interesting about this adventure that they go through here, um, it, it gets into the rules and things like that. So Judges Guild is actually eventually going to publish this adventure that was played at Gen Con 9 as, as an, an adventure um, in 1978. They're going to publish this as the Gen Con 9 adventure. So you can actually play through this one that was played through at Gen Con 9 as a tournament adventure to see like what they were going through. Okay, so there's an ad here for the Dungeon Hobby Shop. We have an ad over here for the Kriegspielers, the military miniatures and accessories. So again, you're more wargaming, you're Napoleonic, but they have some fantastiques here at the bottom, more fantasy style of miniatures. Okay, so then you have your hints for D&D judges. This is by Joe Fisher. So we've talked about Joe Fisher before because if you saw my video on the history of like the cleric and the paladin and the ranger classes, the bard, the illusionist classes, that was all one video. Um, Joe Fisher is actually the guy who invented the ranger class in Strategic Review that Gary Gygax later basically just picks up almost word for word and puts into the player's handbook. Now he does credit Joe Fisher in a small little tiny paragraph in the um, acknowledgements or the thank yous at the beginning of the player's handbook. Um, doesn't say what it was. He just credits the name Joe Fisher, but the implication is that it's because he created the Ranger class. But he has this really fun series of articles that start in the strategic review, actually, and then transition over into Dragon, which are these hints for D&D judges, which is what the judge is what they used to, you know, what we've now called Dungeon Master. At the time, they would call them judges or referees, which makes sense when you think about how they were playing a lot of tournament scenarios and you needed a judge to kind of adjudicate how people were doing, right? So he has one on towns, he has one on wilderness, and then he has one here on the dungeons. So this is uh, just a, a fun article and a um, lot of great ideas. So all three of those articles, the towns, wilderness, and dungeon articles, they're almost exclusively not edition specific, even though this is written very early on before there were even editions of D&D. This is something you could pick up and read and use the vast majority of these ideas, even if in a fifth edition game. So it talks a lot about like trapping chests and what it could be and, and this exploding chest or when the chest is open, a specter comes out or all members within five foot lose one level of experience when the chest is open. I know a lot of people would hate that now, but losing levels was a very common um, thing in early, early editions of D&D. Or it's an intelligent chest, and it can act as if it's a second to ninth level magic user, including casting spells. Kind of a fun idea. So he goes all through here and, and, and talks all about that. Now, one of the things that he's going to point out here is over on the left-hand page, the second column, under this art, now this art here is by Janelle Jakeways, one of her first pieces for Dragon Magazine. Um, but the last paragraph on the right-hand column of the left-hand page, it says James Erdman of the SLWGA. So Jill never says what that is in this entire article. So the implication, again, is that you would know, if you're playing these games, you would know what that means. That is the South Lakes War Game Association. 
And uh, Joe was very, very heavily involved with them. So very similar to like the Lake Geneva um, Tactical Studies Association that Gary Gygax was a part of. This is the South Lakes um, War Game Association. So he's just he's just using the uh, abbreviation or the acronym, um, but never actually tells you what it means. Uh, but you have all these different ideas here. It's kind of fun, um, different items like Hobbit's pipes and what kind of smoke comes out of them. And um, we see a little bit of uh, a play on words here with the pipe weed of stoning, where it says the smoke from this weed will cause any creature within range to be turned to stone. Same throws aloud, gives the range. And it says, note, however, that on any given turn, there's a 25% chance that the wind or something will be blowing the wrong way and the smoker will get stoned. So that's obviously very deliberate use of language there. Um, I guess just kind of funny. So goes on to talk about that now. Here we're going to delve into this art, uh, this story here, Shadow of a Demon. As you see, it says at the top, the dragon is very pleased to welcome Gardner Fox and to introduce you to Niall, I think it's Niall, I'm going to say Niall, of the Far Travels, a brand new hero of many talents. Relax and join Niall on his troubled path through life, but remember that you too should fear the Shadow of a Demon and then copyright Gardner F. Fox. So why was this such a big deal? Why, why are we pointing out Gardner F. Fox. Well, he is a very prolific sword and sorcery, fantasy, science fiction writer, prose writer. He has a lot of, I guess, what you'd call Conan pastiches. So Kothar the Barbarian. There's also Kyrick the Barbarian. Niall of the Far Travels is another Barbarian character. That is who was on the cover of this issue. I showed that earlier. Um, that is this Niall character. So the reason that Gardner Fox was such a big deal was, again, he had written these stories. Now, Kothar and Kyrick are specifically called out by Gary Gygax in the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, Dungeon Master's Guide from 1979 and the Appendix N. Gary said, like, he credits those works by Gardner Fox as inspiration for creating Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So he was, he was well known enough that the people that were creating the game or involved in the game, playing the game, would have read him during this time period. The other reason that I'm a big fan of Gardner Fox is he was a massive comic book writer, contributed so many things that we all know of today, wrote over 4,000 comic book stories, many of them, almost half of them for DC. But he's the guy that created the original Golden Age Flash, the Jake Garrick version, the one with the Mercury helmet with the wings. That was Gardner Fox. Also created Hawkman, created the original Sandman. He created Dr. Fate. And then uh, he created, in, in that early time period, the Justice Society of America, which was the first team up of superheroes in comic book history was the Justice Society of America that's teaming up, um, you know, Hawkman and the Golden Age Green Lantern, the Golden Age Flash, uh, Sandman's in there, the Spectre, um, Dr. F uh, Midnight, I think. So. There's, there's a lot, right? So he creates that first version of the Justice Society and no one had thought of having a team before. And even more importantly, that team actually kind of split across two different, at the time, two different comic book companies. They were sort of owned by the same owner, but it was National and American Comics, I think, that had the different characters. And Gardner Fox put both of them into one book, which created a universe, meaning that those characters lived in the same universe, okay? So that was such a big deal. Now, later on in the Silver Age, he's going to invent things like Zatanna and Barbara Gordon, uh, put her into comic books. And um, he invents the Batarang, uh, the Batman utility belt. He also takes that idea of the Justice Society and then in the Silver Age in the 1960s. So he has a very long prolific career, over 20 years writing in comics, uh, closer to 30, I think. Um, he creates the Justice League of America, which was the first Silver Age superhero team. And that creation of the um, Justice League of America, that led to Marvel Comics creating the Fantastic Four and then later on the Avengers because they were trying to keep up with this team scenario, this team thought. So he also creates the DC multiverse. So if you know anything about DC and you've been paying attention to the latest movies and things like that, especially the Flash movie that came out a couple years ago, this idea that there's a multiverse and and you know even the, Mar the Marvel multiverse, 
owes its credit to Gardner Fox because he created the multiverse for DC when he wrote a story for The Flash in Flash number 123 called The Flash of Two Worlds, where the Silver Age Flash, Barry Allen, interact, which is the one most people know. That's the one I grew up with was Barry Allen. But he interacts with the Golden Age Flash, Jay Garrick, but they weren't on the same world. They were on two different Earths, parallel Earths, but different Earths. And they, through their speed, they end up interacting together. And it was this implication that these Golden Age characters that were alive in World War II were still around. But the reason that we don't hear of them anymore is because they're actually on a different planet or a different Earth. And um, Barry Allen, it was in the prime, the, the current Earth. Okay, so that one story created what is now called the DC multiverse, which then influences Marvel to create their own multiverse. So anyway, very, very important character in comic book history and in fantasy science fiction history. Um, grew up reading, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs books, um, weird tales, planet stories, um, and um, collecting and painting miniature and making miniature soldiers. So he was also a war gamer. Um, so he writes the story again. It's a Conan pastiche. That's that's all you can say about it. But um, this is going to continue for several issues, and it is collected now. All of these Nile um, of the Far Travel stories are collected. I'll put a link in the show notes um, where you can buy like a collection of these stories if you ever want to read. They're kind of fun. Okay, so then we get to this article, The Feathered Serpent. This is by Lynn Harpold. So Lynn is going to end up writing a few Dragon Magazine articles and also does all this art. So all these kind of blue tinted art, that's all done by Lynn. Um, can't find a lot else about Lynn, um, quite honestly. So if anybody knows anything about Lynn Harpold and, and their career um, and, you know, contributions to role-playing games specifically, that's what I'm most interested in. Um, but this article here is about uh, Quetzalcoatl, so the um, South American um, god, uh, Aztec god, and um, basically giving you ideas that you could use to um, put this into uh, you know, your D and D games. So try to make them a little bit more, uh, I don't, you know, I hate, to, I hate to say realistic, but like add some mythology that maybe you, you know, getting out of that non-Western kind of idea. So that's going to be that particular article. Now, this demon story that starts here, it continues over here on the top right-hand corner. It says demon from page 15. You see that? And then it's going to continue here. So we've got now about a good four pages of this story. Um, and not including this little ad that's down here for these miniature figures limited. Okay, and then the story continues over here on the left-hand page, and then you have the debut of the Remoraz, or the Remoraz. I always said Remoraz. I looked it up in the Dragon Magazine issue number 93, Pronunciation Guide by Frank Menzner, and he says you can pronounce it Remoraz or Remoraz. So both are acceptable, so no need for corrections. <laughs> Uh, but you, this is the debut of this famous creature that's going to end up being part of D&D &D all the way until today. It debuts in Dragon Magazine. Have this fun art here by Errol Otis. Um, I always feel like Errol is really great for drawing these really otherworldly kind of creatures that have lots of legs and tentacles and things going on. He just kind of excels at doing that kind of stuff. So that's the creature feature that's going to debut um, the Remoraz. And look, it's only on one page. That's it. That's and, and most of it is this illustration. So that's the entire monster. Then we're going to get back to our story by Gardner Fox, Shadow of the Demon. And you see here, we've got two more pages. So now we're up to about six pages. And it says continued on page 25. And we have even more. So it's it this story is just continuing. It's, it's very long. Okay. So, um, this game over here on the left-hand side, this is an ad. So this is a game called The Ring Bearer. And you see it says second edition. So this was um, basically a, an early sort of war game uh, using Lord of the Rings references without trademark permission. So the second edition strips out all of the terms. So they had hobbits and ants and all that kind of stuff. They strip all that out for this generic thing. So The Ring Bearer is very generic, but it is very clearly a Lord of the Rings inspired game. And um, it does have a referee, which is interesting. So it is straddling that line between a war game. It calls it a fantasy adventure war game rules, but it does have a referee. So there's that little bit of like needing that third impartial person that's not playing, um, but is part of the game. 
And then we see underneath that here, Knights of the Round Table. So this is also called Rules for Fantasy Adventure Wargaming with Miniatures and the Romantic Medieval Era. However, this game uh, does have a, a one-to-one -one relationship between the player and the figure. So you're not playing an army, you're playing an individual figure. It has a referee. Different figures have different abilities. And you improve over time as you gain experience. Um, so those are all hallmarks of role-playing games. So this could technically be called a role-playing game, even though it's, it says that it's rules for fantasy adventure wargaming. And again, part of that is because wargaming as a term hadn't really been invented yet. Um, it mostly focuses on combat. There's a lot of, there's a card mechanic. Um, there, it uses percentiles, but um, it does have um, some stuff on like say chivalry and different encounters and things like that, but it's, it's pretty much dedicated to combat. So um, that's that game. But I, I point this out because again, we're starting to see other companies try to get in on this um, and, and uh, you know, be, um, and take advantage of this new genre of gaming that Dungeons and Dragons created. So this art here on page 25, um, in the, the left top left of, of the column on the right-hand page, that is by Mike Simas. I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, um, but is a fantasy and science fiction artist and does a lot of art for um, different magazines over time. So again, this isn't uh, necessarily called out, but um, uh, you can see the signature here. Okay, and then we have this tiny little bit over here, which is um, continued from page 10. This is the um, continuation of that um, Jake Jacket story. Um, and then you see it down here, it says, to whom it may concern finders keepers signed F Baggins. So you can just tell it's, it's a very kind of goofy, funny story. All right, then we get back to our Gen Con update from page 10. Um, and then you are finishing of our hints. Uh, this is the hints for D and D judges for dungeons article um, that continues from page thirteen. And you see all these different sub tables here for generating what kind of people are going to be or what kind of creatures are going to be in different parts of the dungeon. And then he talks about the favorite books of the judges can be turned into parts of the castle or worlds that adventurers can be transported to, like Larry Niven's Ringworld or Tolkien's Moria, Clark Ashton Smith's Hyperborea. Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost Worlds or um, Fritz Leiber's um, Nemon. So uh, I think that's very interesting, again, because you're starting to see pointing out these um, different influences that can inspire you. A lot of these are going to end up in Gary Gygax's Appendix, uh, Appendix N. Uh, he also here, he talks about Dune, and then he talks about um, using uh, like H.G. Wells' Martians or Larry Niven's Puppeteers. And then he says... Um, uh, you know, like your people, creatures from Star Trek. And he said, how would you like to be walking down a corridor in a dungeon and be transported to another strange looking corridor on the quote, Starship Enterprise with a tall humanoid with pointed ears saying highly illogical. And uh, so again, that's just how people played a lot back then. They mixed genres. They weren't trying to make it serious. They weren't trying to do something that was going to be you know, published later on. I think a lot of people approach D and D like I'm going to play this game and then write up my thing as a like the world's best fantasy novel. Back then, people just played and they threw in all kinds of influences because they weren't trying to do that. So they didn't care if they were borrowing things from all these different sources. They were just having fun. Use the things that are fun. Okay, and then we see down here, and uh, this is uh, something that I really like that Tim Cask implemented when he took over in Strategic Review, which is giving credit for people who worked on this issue. So he's the editor. Graphics are by David Sutherland, covered by Tom Canty. We already talked about all of them. Your contributing artists on page four and 15, it says Jay Seaton. We talked about that. We see uh, Jake Ways on page 12, talked about that. So page 15, Tom Canty. So see how is, there's already a mistake because it says pages four and 15 are by Seaton. But then it says page 15 is by Canty. So if we go back and look at page 15, um, that to me looks more like a um, Tom Canty picture, not a John Seaton picture. So this right here, this color one on the left-hand side, that's John Seaton. And if you look at that style and then look at this, I don't think they're very similar. So I think that's just a mistake of calling out the attribution to the art. But 
we also see Errol Otis called out. We see Mike Symes. And then uh, Jay Niera. I don't know how to pronounce that name. I cannot find anything about that person. So that's another one where if you have information on who Jay Niera, Ni Niera, whoever that is, um, I would love to know more. Um, because I don't want these people to be forgotten. You know, I, I want to make sure that that people are aware that, that these people existed and that they contributed to this hobby that we love. So I'd love to um, address that oversight in a future video if anybody knows anything about them. OK, and then it, again, it says all others staff. So um, not really helpful. OK, so this press release that's written here, this is written by um, uh, well, it's for Richard Mataka press release. And so it's interesting because it's copyrighted to Richard. So this was actually distributed across a lot of different magazines at the time, but it's essentially reviews. That's what this is. It's reviews of different games. So you see a review here of Star Command and um, Venerable Destruction, which is a fantasy board game. And, um, and so it's interesting. We're going to see some commentary on these reviews in a future um, issue of Dragon. All right. A new D&D character class, The Alchemist. This is by John Pickens. Now, I have talked a little bit about John Pickens before, but in case you didn't see that. So he works at TSR and eventually also works at Wizards of the Coast. So he spans over both companies and obviously was there for a very long time because this is 1976 and he's already contributing stuff for um, for Dungeons and Dragons in 1976. And third edition D&D and the Watsi takeover doesn't happen until around the year 2000. And so that's a long time to be working in this industry. Uh, but he uh, is from Indiana. He gets into a war game called Blitzkrieg. He starts reading a magazine called Strategy and Tactics, and he can't find all the back issues that he wants. He sees an ad from someone that's selling the back issues, contacts that person who happens to be Gary Gygax. And they meet... John Pickens eventually goes to a convention, gets introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. But that's the very, very quick version of this. He's also very involved with the, the gaming club at Valparaiso University, which is going to come up later as well. So he writes for Dragon Magazine. He writes for Alarms and Excursions, and he's hired as a TSR editor. He works on the Arms and Equipment Guide for 2nd Edition D&D. And then again, he was very involved with the 3rd Edition of Dungeons & Dragons. And he was sort of TSR's go-to research guy. Because again, you got to remember, this is pre-internet. So he had just files of stuff like that he found interesting. And so when people were working on different things, he usually had books or files or papers or whatever that he could give them and say, here's research for you to use to, to work on this particular thing. And so he kind of became known as that guy. So uh, here he creates an alchemist class. Now I've talked about alchemist class before in a video. However, that version that I talked about was a later one. It's not this one. I actually like this one better, even though I guess you could say it's, you know, quote, more primitive in terms of the design which I like because it's not as fiddly. That other one had just way too much going on. Now, a lot of people will say that this version of the Alchemist class by John Pickens is actually too powerful, partly because of their um, capability of using poisons. But, you know, you can always dial that down, right? But I, I just like it because I don't like classes that require pages and pages and pages of mechanics and bookkeeping. I just, just not for me. And so this one is pretty straightforward. Got some fun level titles here. It gets into how um, the class has abilities, again, with being able to detect poison, to neutralize poison, to neutralize paralysis, to identify potions, and then create potions. So those are kind of like the main abilities that they're going to have um, over time. But the poisons thing is a big deal. And then it creates like some really interesting kind of um, different, um, you know, potions, as an example, the Tanglefoot potion. Um, I remember Tanglefoot bags being a big thing in third edition d and I don't remember them before that. They may have appeared in previous versions. As just a reminder, I was not super involved in the second edition era. I collected a lot of stuff. I didn't play a lot. And so um, yeah, I was playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay when second edition advanced D&D came out. So if Tanglefoots were in that version, that's fine. I just wasn't aware of that. Um, but he talks about that here. And... Um, different types of potions, immunization from lycanthropes. And um, that brings me to a fun joke that I heard, which is, what do you call a um, a werewolf influencer? Like and subscribe. 
<laughs> so, and speaking of, um, if you would like to like and subscribe this video, I would really uh, appreciate it very, very much. So um, another thing that this alchemist class inspired me to is that I created my own version of an alchemist class that I'm doing for the old school essentials version of um, it's a retro game that's a clone of the 1981 Moldvade BX rules. And I have a whole book that I'm going to be publishing soon. It's going to be on Kickstarter, hopefully in April. We'll see. Um, April of 2024, but it's about expert and specialist characters. And one of them is an alchemist. And I took some inspiration from this class as well as from a few others. Okay. So then we have this whole thing. And then we have a follow-up article by um, John Pickens. I say follow-up because it's by him. It has nothing to do with the alchemist class. But it's D&D option weapon damage. So this is really interesting. Again, as a point in time of Dungeons & Dragons. An original Dungeons & Dragons Every weapon did D6 damage. Every class had D6 hit, hit dice. So it didn't matter. Magic user, cleric, fighter, D6 hit dice. And every weapon did D6 damage. With the debut of Greyhawk Supplement 1, that began to change. And they began suggesting that you can have different hit dice for different types of classes. So thieves and magic users were bumped to D4. Thieves debut at D4. And um, fighters get D8. And then um, uh, there's a weapon thing in there where it talks about how different, um, uh, weapons can have different, uh, dies for damage. Sorry, I'm kind of choking a little bit from my allergies. So just, I'm, I'm trying to talk and, and not cough at the same time. So anyway, uh, that's an article that, or uh, that's part of the supplement of Greyhawk is that weapon damage is going to be different now with different dice. And so, this article is saying, well, you can take that a step further and talks about how for every three levels that a fighter advances and every four levels of a thief, they can master an additional weapon and score increased damage shown on the expert column. So thieves are limited to expertise in sword dagger or combination of these or the sling. So a very, very early version of um, weapon specialization or weapon expertise, whatever you want to call it, that's going to that's gonna influence D&D design all the way into the future, into 5th edition, this idea that certain characters are better at using certain weapons than other types of characters, and they get to do extra things with them. So in, in this case, John's saying, well, you can do extra damage. So very, very interesting, very short. It's not fiddly, very easy to implement if you want to do that. All right, and then we have our ad over here on the right-hand side. It says, it's here, the last the D&D last supplement. So it does say there is a question mark, um, but a lot of people ask. So I talked about the original D&D before, and I talked about the first four supplements, and a few people said, how come you didn't talk about swords and spells? We're going to see an ad for swords and spells in Dragon Magazine number three. The reason I didn't really talk about it is because I don't consider it a supplement in terms of expanding the options for Dini. It is basically a, a mass combat system for Dungeons and Dragons. It's it's recreating chainmail, but using the D and D combat system instead of the chainmail combat system. But other than that, it's a mass combat system. And this article here, this ad says that God's Demon Gods and Heroes is the last D D supplement. Again, I recognize the question mark. So they're asking if it is or you know, maybe they didn't know at the time, but um Swords and spells, it just I, I consider it a little bit differently. It's sort of like a it's an it's an add-on, but it's not a it's not part of the rules. I, I don't know how to describe that. It's just how it's just how I view it. If you want to consider swords and spells to be supplement five, that's great. So um so that's it. And then that's our back cover where it talks about what's coming next in Little Wars over here on the left hand side. So um again, very, very focused on wargaming miniature war game, and then the next issue of Dragon and what we're going to see there. But we're going to cover that in a minute, so I'm not going to go over that. And that's going to cover our look at Dragon Magazine number two. All right, now we're going to look at Dragon Magazine issue number three. Again, this debuts in October of 1976. And we have this very science fiction cover here, and that's probably because this cover is going to be related to an article that's going to appear in here by Gary Gygax. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second. But this cover is by uh, John Seaton. We've talked about John before. We just talked about him in the last issue. And Ivor, Ivor M. Yancey, who um, they were childhood friends. And uh, so they knew each other for a very long time. And um, it's actually Yancey. 
I, I'm saying Yancey, Yancey, uh, I hope I'm not mispronouncing that. Apologies if I am. Uh, but he ends up working on a lot of art for um, SPI games. And he works on the Indiana Jones game. He works on Top Secret. And he eventually becomes the art director for TSR, uh, at which point um, uh, he's in that position when he ends up retiring or leaving, not retiring, he leaves TSR in 1985 to go work for um, Tonka Toys. Uh, so he advances very far. So that you know, his first appearance here in Dragon Magazine with this um, kind of striking science fiction color uh, cover with this sort of Saturn looking, you're in a ringed planet. Um, so let's dive in and see what we have in here. Uh, sorry for that. So, okay. So over here on the left, we have TSR is proud to present the game of Lankmar by Fritz Lee Lieber. Forget, I know somebody corrected me on this last time. It's Lieber or Lieber and I apologize. And Harry Fisher. Okay, so um, that game was actually originally created in 1937. So it's it's a war game, it's a, it's a board game, but, TSR basically um, revised it and did some work on it with um, Gary Gygax works on it with Rob Koontz, uh, with Fritz, and also with um, a man by the name of Brad Stock. He's going to come up later here in a second. But um, Brad ends up working on some other board games, uh, but he's not super prolific from what I can tell as far as the gaming industry, uh, but does work on this revision to um, the Longmar game. So uh, you see here it's um, $10, which was the price of Dungeons and Dragons at the time, the box set. And um, so that's kind of it with um, for that particular ad. So uh, we see here again, Dragon Rumbles. And the premise of this particular editorial by Tim Cask is that he's saying that like, he's basically defining what fantasy is, what it means. And then he says, all these points have been made in defense of including fiction within the pages of the dragon. So remember last issue, he's asking people, what do you want to see in the magazine? And he specifically says, do you want to see fiction? And it sounds like he got some people saying that they didn't want to see that. And so he's defending that he's going to keep it in here anyway. <laughs> so, um, which is fine, you know, so um, he says, the complaints have not been numerous by any means, but most are marked by their vociferousness and um, vehemence. So he says all the games would play are fiction, and then he goes on to talk about it. And then essentially his sort of point of view of this is that he says that whether it's game content or fiction, it's both going to help running your games because the fiction is going to inspire you and help you be more creative. And so you'd be smart essentially to, you know, absorb as much as you can of fantasy fiction, sword and sorcery, science fiction, all that kind of stuff, because the more concepts you explore, regardless of whether you agree with them or accept them or not, the more raw material you have for your own imagining processes. I 100% agree with that. So, um, you know, it's why I cover a lot of different variety of topics uh, here on my channel, on my blog, and uh, when I tweet and things like that. It's because you never know where inspiration is going to come from. So if your only source of inspiration is the latest Dungeons and Dragons manual, you, you're talking in an echo chamber to just a, a very small portion of the wide world of fantasy and science fiction. So it behooves you to explore other, you know, whether it's comic books or fiction or nonfiction. Um, I read a book, um, I blogged about this before, but I read a book called The History of the World in Six Glasses. And it was essentially a history of how um, just like clean water, distilled spirits, um, uh, wine, beer, soda, coffee. I, I guess it's coffee and tea. So I guess clean water wasn't one of them. It's, it's definitely coffee and tea, spirits, soda, beer, and wine. But anyway, it talks about how those six drinks influenced the direction of the human existence and how so many things that we have created and developed over time, whether it's physical structures or whether it's philosophy and governments and things like that, were all based or were influenced by the availability of these different types of drinks. And so I blogged about how much I liked that concept. And um, one of the things that it talked about was how the 17th century or 16th century coffee house 
17th century, let's say, coffee house sort of became like their version of the internet. That's where people from different cultures and different societies and social structures came to share news of the day and um, ideas. And somebody uh, wrote and said, like, I could see that being a premise of a role playing game, like swap out the tavern for this coffee house and use that as your way to disseminate information. It's just like, that's kind of cool that like somebody saw that and that it inspired them. And um, I try to be inspired like that all the time. So anyway, it's a long rambling thing to basically just say, I agree with Tim McCast's statement here that absorbing as much as you can is only going to help with your imagination process. However, he does then go on to say, in response to these letters, fiction will no longer take up nearly as much space. So already after two issues of Dragon, we're on the third one here, but after the first two, he's already saying fiction's going to be less because you saw how much of that last issue was fiction, not just there was the gnome cache, there was a story by Jerry Jacket, uh, Jacket, and then there was the story by Gardner Fox. Took up a huge part of that magazine. So he's saying that's no longer going to be the case. And then he says the Niall story in the last, the dragon, the last TD, took up so much space because of a lack of communication between myself and the typesetter, and it was set too large. And so um, he's apologizing for that, I guess. Um, anyway, he says, I will be printing a new Gardner Fox Niall story in the dragon number six. So he's, I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to change how much space it uses. We finally have our page of contents here on the right-hand page to tell us what's going to be in the magazine. Now, what's interesting here is you see staff artist Dave Sutherland, but no longer are they going to call out who's illustrating which piece. It's just there's a staff artist. That's Dave Sutherland. I don't think he does all of the art in this particular issue. So there you go. <laughs> anyway, but we're going to see all the different contents here, but we're just going to jump in and talk about it. So this first article is, does anyone remember War of the Empires? I'm not going to get into the the too much detail on this particular game, but essentially War of the Empires was um, a very early science fiction war game. And Gary Gygax is making the claim that it might have been the earliest science fiction war game, but it was um, a postal game or PBM played by mail. And Gary Gygax played in this game. And then the creator of the game, um, I'm going to call him Tulio Proni. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. But um, the game eventually kind of goes into remission. And Gary writes to the guy and says, hey, would you mind if I took this back over and ran it myself? And Gary ends up running it for a while. But it's just so much work writing up the battle reports because, it's, again, it's play by mail. So people are sending in, like, these are my moves. This is what I'm doing. And then Gary has to read through all that or whoever's running the game. And then send out a report of this is what's happened so that you can play again. It's a lot of work, especially in a day before computers and, and having, um, you know, a way to organize this information. And so the game eventually just kind of fades away. And Gary's saying, like, I think it could come back. It was an interesting game creation. Um, and he says, although the individual games were, you know, sometimes not that much, the whole had potential for it offered continuing involvement in science fiction campaign where players could play many postal games, become involved in authoring material for the newsletter, cover or read about almost anything connected with the whole genre and so forth. So anyway, um, he laments that this game is gone and wants it to come back. But I think this is the article that inspired the cover is why it's a science fiction cover, because this is the lead article in the magazine. Okay, so then we have uh, here this um, ad on the left-hand side for a game called Starweb by Flying Buffalo. Again, this is a multiplayer hidden movement play by mail space game. So Flying Buffalo, very famous for um, play by mail games. We talked about them earlier in my video on those four post D&D um, &D games from 1975. We've already talked about this Women in Magic article, so we can skip past that. Uh, we go to the search for the gnome cache. Like now we've, we're getting our attribution again by Garrison Ernst, Chapter 3. And so this is going to continue uh, the story that he's writing. Um, but, uh, again, using up maybe a little less space of fiction in this particular issue. So, uh, that continues on the next page here. And then we get to this fun article, um, here on page 14, uh, starting on the bottom right, uh, right hand corner of the left hand page, birth tables for D and D by Brad Stock and Brian Lane. So I talked about Brad Stock before I looked up, worked on that Longmore game. Um, Brian Lane, uh, I don't have too much information um about brian i'm just checking my notes here really quickly um did write articles for alarms and excursions that's kind of the main uh, thing that i saw that brian had kind of contributed to from a role-playing game standpoint but 
what's really interesting about these as far as the future of Dungeons and Dragons and um, where the game goes, these birth tables are kind of interesting. Gary Gygax is going to have birth tables appear in the advanced uh, Dungeon Masters, uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Masters Guide in 1879. But if we go over here to the, um, trying to find where it is on here, it might be on the next page. Sorry, I had found this earlier, and now I'm having trouble finding it. My eyes just aren't what they used to be. Um, it's here. Page 16, left-hand column, the far left, halfway down, table one. And uh, it gives this list of what you can be as a commoner. And you see here it says half goblin, half orc, human, half elf, or dwarf, and hobbit. This is going to be the first instance, I believe, for Dungeons and Dragons specifically, of the mention of the species of half orc. So clearly, this is pulling probably, I would guess, from Tolkien. Um, but you don't see half orcs before this in any um, connotation. You don't see them in basic Dungeons and Dragons when Holmes Basic comes out. Um, Holmes Basic even removes half elves, which were introduced in the Greyhawk Supplement 1. Gary Gygax is going to put half orcs into the uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons along with half orcs, and he's also going to add gnomes. Those are the ones that get added. So um, this is, uh, you know, I believe the first appearance of the term half orc in conjunction with Dungeons and Dragons. You also see that he's still using the term hobbit instead of halfling. Okay, so then you see over here advanced notice metro. Uh, this is the right hand column of the left hand page, so page sixteen. But um, you see this column here. It says advanced notice Metro Detroit Gamers proudly presents WinterCon Five Game Fest with special guests Gary Gygax, Brian Bloom, and Rob Koontz of TSR Hobby Inc. So what is important about this particular game convention and um, the history of Dungeons and Dragons is that that is the convention where Gary Gygax debuts and runs um, the uh, Lost Caverns of Tsajkanth. It was called C O N T H or Tsajkanth. It's not Tsaj. It's Tsajkanth. Um, that eventually is going to be published as um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Module S Four Lost Caverns of Tsajkanth. So that debuts at this convention where he was a special guest, WinterCon 5, um, hosted by the Metro, Metro, Metro Detroit Gamers. Sorry, I couldn't say that. Okay. Over here on the right-hand page, we have the first debut of a long, ongoing cartoon that's going to appear in Dragon going up through issue number, uh, forget the number, 54, I think, uh, in 1981. It's not in every issue between number three and number 54, but it's in a lot of them. So this is by um, a gentleman by the name of J.D. Webster. It just says J.D. here. But this is Phineas Fingers. So this is a classic D&D cartoon that um, uh, you know a lot of old timers remember. There are collections of the Phineas Fingers books that you can find um, of just these cartoons. But it's basically about this sort of, um, you know, maybe not all that capable thief character. Phineas Fingers and uh, just and it involves D and D mechanics because he's talking about um, uh, he can he's listening he's listening at this door and he's like saying oh I can hear a door slamming like I hear all these different things and now he's trying to pick a lock and so it's it's interesting in that it's involving D and D mechanics but it's a it's a cartoon okay so um, J D Webster was a U.S. Navy fighter pilot. And um, because of that, he was still involved with the Navy, which is partly why the publication of um, Phineas Fingers is a little sporadic over time. Um, it eventually moves into Adventure Gaming Magazine, which is a magazine that Tim Cask starts um, after he's left Dragon. And then I think it moves to, I want to say, Space Gamer for a while. Um, but it has a long history in the role-playing game community, and it debuts here in issue number three. All right, so then we see um, this article here on the Wargaming World, and it's talking about, this is a review of some new figures, some new uh, miniatures that are coming out from different companies. And then again, here we see our Mapping the Dungeons, uh, which is, our, again, our name of our names and addresses, contact info for um, different D&D &D, um, players. And it says here, um, EPT players. And then it says, and DMs everywhere. So we talked about this a little bit before this came up. Um, where in Tunnels and Trolls 1975 is where I first think is the appearance of the term Dungeon Master or DM. But um, 
uh, he doesn't say DM, he says Dungeon Master. But you don't see that in Dragon or the Strategic Review or in any Dungeon Dragons publication until after the publication of Tunnels and Trolls, April 1975. But they've already started using it here. And eventually, of course, um, TSR and then later Wizards of the Coast are going to trademark that term. Okay, so anyway, we have all these list of people here. Now, the one I want to point out is in the D&D section. About halfway down, you see Alan Hammock. We have talked about Alan Hammock before in my video on Top Secret that I just recently published. So uh, one of the uh, editors of that game. Okay, so now we see out on a limb. These are some letters that people have written in. There's There's been enough time between the first and second issues coming out that people could have written in. And then, um, uh, so Dragon and specifically Tim Casca's editor is going to publish their letters. So the first letter, again, I'm not going to read all of these, but I'm going to point out some interesting pieces of it. So the first letter here, this person says, I've been a student of military history for the past several years when I discovered TSR Hobbies. After ordering the dungeon game out of a magazine, I got the TSR catalog and found the world of wargaming. So basically he's talking about like he uh, is a wargamer, but he doesn't know any other wargamers in his area, but he wants to wargame. And then he says he subscribed to the magazine. And then as you read through, basically says, I have trouble understanding a lot of the content because it's so focused on Dungeons and Dragons. And he doesn't play that game. He plays Dungeon the board game, but he doesn't play Dungeons and Dragons, the what we would now call role-playing game. And so he keeps pointing out some interesting things where he's talking about like, this was strange or this was weird, or I think this was too goofy. Um, and then he says, like, uh, as an example, he says, um, the creature feature is fascinating, even if I don't understand it. So, um, again, so early in the hobby and um, to have this kind of interesting article here. Uh, the next one, this guy's complaining that he wanted to photocopy stuff from Dragon Magazine and then sell it to his friends um, at cost uh, to use. And he actually, and rather than just doing it, he wrote in and asked for permission and they said no. And so he's complaining here that they said no. And um, Tim Kask is, is basically saying, the, no, you can't. Like, there's no exceptions because um, you just can't. So there's that. Now, this next letter here, it says editor. This is going to start at the bottom of page 20 on the left-hand side and continue through two-thirds of the page on the right-hand side. I'm just going to say it's it's written by Louis Pulsifer. So he basically is complaining about a lot of the stuff that he's seeing in the magazine and things that he doesn't like. Um, he's disappointed with the amount of space taken up by ads and illustrations because there's no point in having those. Uh, he doesn't know how publishing works if he thinks that you can't have ads to support a magazine like this. It's just not possible. Um, but he doesn't want the illustrations, which I think is weird because then you just have a wall of text that nobody wants to read. Um, and then um, he talks about game reviews could be more complete. So he's complaining about the reviews written by that guy that was, it was syndicated. It was copyrighted by someone else. And Dragon's just kind of repurposing it. But he's complaining specifically about the way that that guy writes his reviews. And then um, he thinks that uh, the article where Larry Smith introduced the three kindreds of the Eldar. So I talked about this in my coverage of the first issue of Dragon Magazine. Um and uh, basically, Lou Pulsford is, is disagreeing with this person's, Larry Smith's, interpretation of Tolkien and the Eldar. And so what's interesting, the reason I point this one out and I spent so much time on it is because Louis Pulsford is actually going to end up being uh, working for um, TSR. So um, very, you know, later on in his career. So uh, he becomes a contributing editor and he also designs a lot of strategy board games. So um, he's writing this article very early on, and it's just funny to see his name here because I recognized it right away, and I know that he ends up working um, with the company later. Uh, Larry Smith, the guy who wrote the article on the Eldar, he writes a um, you know dissenting opinion to this guy's, uh, to Louis Pulsifer's um, disagreement with his point of view. So now we get into sort of the meat of the, the mechanics that are going to be in this issue, specifically for Dungeons and Dragons, which are new obscure subclasses. So I covered almost all these in my video on the early um, D and D subclasses from Dragon Magazine. And again, I'm going to have links either in the show notes or if there's enough left, I'll have some here in the upper right hand corner where you can go find that video. But definitely seek those out. I have a whole playlist. Um, it's a sub playlist of my history playlist, which is about D&D classes. And you can find tons of information on these early classes like healers and scribes. 
and um, what else is in here? The samurai. So I talked about all those before, so I'm not going to go over them now. Here's our ad on the left-hand side for the Swords and Spells supplement. And you'll see it specifically doesn't say Supplement 5. It just says Swords and Spells um, Miniature War Game Rules for Dungeons & Dragons. So again, you could quibble whether this is a supplement for D&D or not. Um, I kind of consider it a separate thing, but I... I can't argue with someone who says it is a supplement. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, over here on the right-hand side, Tim Cask is asking for authors and artists and says that they will pay one cent per word minimum. Which I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but I can tell you during the third edition era of Dungeons and & Dragons and the um, D20 system, a lot of publisher, and that's like 25 years after this came out, a lot of publishers were paying one cent a word for content. So um, 25 years later. So to me, that means that this one cent per word was actually not that bad. Um, probably not enough to live on, but you know. Uh, now, new view on dwarves, and this is by Larry Smith. So this is the same guy who wrote the article on the Eldar that Luke Pulsifer was complaining about in the Out of the Limb uh, letters column. But this is basically saying, well, contrary to popular or public opinion, dwarves are not poor fighters that they um, that many claim they are. And so basically he's trying to fix, you know, quote unquote, fix the D&D dwarf to be more like the Tolkien dwarf because he thinks that what's, that's what dwarves should be. Now, remember, Larry Smith ends up kind of becoming the Tolkien expert for TSR. They, he's their go-to guy when they have Tolkien questions. And uh, so this article here is just about making dwarves like bumping them up a little bit to, to make them a little bit better, essentially. Um, we see a new D&D character subclass, the Berserker. This is by John Pickens. Now they've misspelled his name here. There's no H, it's J-O-N. Um, but we did talk about John just a minute ago when I talked about the Alchemist that was in issue number two. And I did talk about the Berserker class again in that other video that I, that I mentioned earlier. So I'm not going to go over that. Now these two... Um, the Idiot class and the Jesters. They look like they could have come out of the April issue, like the April Fool's issue that Dragon was famous for doing, um, but they don't. They're in here. I don't have a lot of, to say about these two. They're they're kind of joke classes. They're, they're, they're meant to be funny. Um, I don't think they were ever intended to be played, certainly not by a player, maybe an NPC. I just don't see why you'd want to. Both of these authors, Gordon Davidson, and then um, for the Jesters, Charles Carter, William Canton and Pete Simon. I can't find anything about them as far as like their um, history of working in the role-playing game industry. So I think this is sort of like a one and done for all of these authors. Um, but these are just uh, goofy, funny classes. So, and again, I apologize for my allergies. I have to keep pausing because I'm having to take a breath so I don't um, start coughing in the middle of the video. Okay, so then you get this article here on the left-hand page, the Gen Con 9 D&D Elimination Tournament by Bob Blake, who was the one I was kind of like in charge of running this. And essentially, this is that we talked about this the last issue. This is the um, tournament that is going to be um, later published as an adventure by Judges Guild that you could play. Um, but uh, he's talking about, they got a lot of complaints, like why were there no intelligent encounters? And so he's saying, well, the goal was to have each group DM by the uh, have each group DM the same way, but they have multiple groups and they weren't all DM by the same person. And so in order to do that, they had to limit these sort of intelligent encounters because there's no accounting for how each DM would adjudicate that. It had to be very black and white, straightforward. So they couldn't get into a lot of the, the intelligent role playing aspects because how do you judge that? And then, um, why were useless spells such as sleep and charm person included on the spell list? He gets into that. Choosing languages was useless. Why was that done? He says, well, it was done to maintain, maintain consistency among DMs and keep things as simple as possible. And um, why did you only have 100 entrants? Why was the individual scored rather than the team? And so he gets into all that. We talked a little bit about that before. But then he thanks Rob Koontz, Dave McGarry, and Mike Carr. We've talked about all three of those people before um, on the channel. And then you get to see the the accolades to the winners, and they were, and again, I'm going to point out, Alan Hammock was the champion mage. He does go on to work for TSR and become an editor and um, help with game design. So um, it's interesting to, and, and fun to see him listed here. They also had some awards that they gave at this convention. The um, Strategist Club 
Awards for Creativity and Gaming for 1975. Best new game was Empire of the Petal Throne. We've talked about that game before. Outstanding designer, M.A.R. Barker, um, who is the creator of Empire of the Petal Throne. Outstanding writer, uh, E. Gary Gygax. And then the best miniature figure release was the McEwen Heroes and Wizards fantasy line. And the best war game publication was the Strategic Review, which by this time is no longer being published. So um, that's it. And then you have this tiny little article here at the bottom of the uh, again, I'm on the left-hand page, page 30, but right-hand column. And it says uh, combat modifications for dexterity. So this idea is that if you have a lower dexterity, it makes it harder to hit and you do less damage and you're harder to defend. It's harder for you to defend. And then if you have a higher dexterity, um, you know, the, the converse is true. And this is giving exceptional dexterity. That's what those percentages are for. So there was a time when... Um, rather than go from 18 to 19, because there was no 19, you got to 18 and then you rolled percentage. And if you rolled over, say, in this case, 51 or higher, it gave you more bonuses than if you'd had an 18 and then a percentage of 1 to 50, as an example. So um, this was a variant. This person's just suggesting, hey, it would make sense that your dexterity would affect your ability to fight with weapons. Um, this is not necessarily adopted the missile part was already part of the game so missile and then the defense your ac um but these parts like hitting with any weapon and damage those don't end up being um part of um dungeons and dragons rules going forward and add over here for winter fantasy one in january of 1977 to be held in lake geneva wisconsin at the american legion hall and they're going to have some advent uh some games with the um and part of the pedal throne they're going to have dnd fantasy board game tournaments um all of these done these are all tsr games that you see listed here battle of the five irons was distributed by tsr at the time we've talked about that before so um it doesn't look like this is an official tsr convention but it is. Um, it says for further information, contact Rob Koontz. He was he was a TSR person at the time, so um, it's probably just coincidental. He's picking the games that TSR um, was publishing or distributing, or both. And then um, this is our look look at what's coming next in Little Wars on the on the left, and then the next issue of um, Dragon here on the right. So that's going to wrap this up. But again, I, I wanted to really point out some of the content that we're seeing in these early issues and how it ends up being folded into and incorporated and influencing the direction of D and D in the future. So I hope that you found that interesting and um, please let me know in the comments if, if you enjoyed it. Also let me know, you know, I, I know I've been making a lot of really long videos and I can never tell what the right one is to do because for every person that says that they're too long, I get at least that number of people, if not more, saying the longer the better. So I've I've heard from people that put these on to help them <laughs> uh, relax. I hope that doesn't mean I'm too boring. But um, people say that, like, you know, I get a lot of people, I think they're just listening. They're not even watching the video, which is fine. And um, thank you for doing that. Um, but I don't want to turn off people for them being too long. So please let me know um, if I should have broken this up into just two different issues. I just feel like going issue by issue, I've mentioned this before, might just be a little too much. So I thought I would kind of combine these two and see what happened. So um, again, I really hope that you enjoyed the, vi the video. Please leave a comment below to let me know. You also find places below where you can join me on social media. You'll find... Um, uh, links to my blog where I share content and you'll find a link to my shop where you can help support the channel by buying something like a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, etc. So I just debuted a brand new design and I'll show that here uh, at the shop. It's not D&D related, but um, it's a funny quote from Empire Strikes Back that I think works on a few different levels. And uh, that's my new design that I just put out there. So uh, let me know what you think about that in the comments below. And uh, with that said, I'd like to thank you so very much for watching. Stay safe. Happy gaming, and I will talk to you next time. Now for the bonus content, what I was drinking, what I was listening to when I worked on my notes for this video. I'm actually still drinking the same thing. Um, it's just tea, uh, some Earl Grey tea. This is my little strainer here. And um, I put some lemon and honey in it because as you could hear on the video, I hope it wasn't too distracting, but um, uh, my allergies are just, I'm so stuffy and, and um it's uh, affecting my throat and, and I keep coughing and stuff. So I thought some tea would help. So there we go with that. Nothing, again, too fancy today. Uh, listening wise, I needed something to kind of pick me up because I was getting really um, tired. And so I put this on.
This is Ray Charles in person. So this is originally recorded in 1959 at a concert in Atlanta. It's a live album released in 1960. And uh, it's a really fun kind of period of time because he's covering um, a lot of different genres of music. So he's got some big band stuff on here, like Yes, Indeed by Cy Oliver, but made most famous by Tommy Dorsey. And then Frenesy um, made famous, I would say, you know, mostly people know the Artie Shaw version, both um, big band leaders. And uh, so he's covering that. But then um, probably the best version of what I'd say, um, uh, I, th I think probably most people would agree that it's like it's it's his most dynamic version of that song. So uh, a great album. Again, it was a little peppy. It kind of a, it was a nice pick me up. This is my version from uh, Vinyl Me Please VMP. So. It's a it's a new pressing uh, on 180 gram, but it comes with this great little um, booklet of notes, uh, which you know they do a really nice job with their packaging. There's an OB strip on the on the um, on the thing. I took that off just to show. And then the vinyl itself is in really nice condition, but it's um, it's on this blue kind of vinyl here that you see. So um, that's it. And uh, again, thank you very much for watching the video today. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that also you will check out some of these other videos uh, that are shown here. All right. Thanks. And I'll talk to you next time.